Welcome to the Macmillan Report. I'm Marilyn Wilkes, your host, and our guest is Ibu Patel, the founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps. He is at Yale to give the Coca-Cola World Fund Lecture at the Macmillan Center. Named by U.S. News and World Report as one of America's best leaders of 2009, Mr. Patel is the author of the book Sacred Ground, Pluralism, Prejudice, and the Promise of America and his 2007 autobiography, Acts of Faith, the story of an American Muslim, the struggle for the soul of a generation. He is also a member of President Obama's Advisory Council of the White House Office of Faith-Based and Neighborhood Partnerships. Today we talk with Mr. Patel about his new book, Sacred Ground. Welcome. Great to be with you, Marilyn. Thank you. Let's begin with the organization you founded, Interfaith Youth Corps. Tell us about it and why you felt it was important to found it. Sure. So the idea for Interfaith Youth Corps hit me probably 15 <coughs> years ago. Uh, I was a college student in the early to mid-1990s at mm -hmm. a time when the multicultural movement was at an inflection point and service learning was a big deal on college campuses also. And there were a lot of projects and organizations that were bringing people of different racial and ethnic backgrounds together to do service. Okay. Teach for America, City Year. And it kind of occurred to me as I was deepening into my, mo my own Muslim identity at the time and as I was uh, uh, studying other religions and their calls to serve others, why, why not bring Hindus and humanists, Muslims and Buddhists, uh, Jews and Catholics together to do service? Mm -hmm. All of our religions call us to serve others. Service is a great way of bringing people from different backgrounds together in a common project. So that was the, the I guess, the original animating idea of Interfaith Youth Corps. Mm -hmm. And it's since grown into uh, a really ambitious organization and movement. And the kind of generational goal of Interfaith Youth Corps is to help make social, uh, to help make interfaith cooperation a social norm okay. in the way that human rights or that uh, volunteerism or that civil rights are social norms. And we believe that college campuses are kind of mini civil societies that can model interfaith mm -hmm. cooperation for the rest of the country and that college students can be uh, inspired and trained and mobilized to be interfaith leaders. Mm -hmm. So that's what we do at Interfaith Youth Corps. We partner with college campuses to help them model interfaith cooperation and we run interfaith leadership institutes for college students to become interfaith leaders. Okay, and then do you track that um, uh, the pattern out when they go graduate and go out into the world? I mean, do they continue that kind of work? Yeah, that's a great question. So uh, uh, that is a part of, you know, to, to use kind of a nerdy term, that's kind of our, that, that's part of our theory of change, mm -hmm. this notion that college students uh, if they if they begin to view themselves as interfaith leaders during a formative stage in their lives when they're 18, 19, 20 years old, and if they have a chance to apply the knowledge base and skill set of interfaith leadership on their campuses mm -hmm. by running something we call a Better Together campaign, that that's the the their first steps towards leading a life of interfaith leadership. Mm -hmm. And we have a, a really robust alumni program at Interfaith Youth Corps that helps college students do everything from go on to divinity school, to study uh, uh, world religions and interfaith leadership, or to go on to be doctors, lawyers, uh, hedge fund managers, Washington DC types who will take the perspective of interfaith leadership into whatever vocation or career path they mm -hmm. choose. And, and for us, our definition of interfaith leadership is pretty straightforward and concrete. It's an interfaith leader is somebody with the knowledge base and skill set to build understanding and cooperation amongst people and groups who orient around religion differently. Mm -hmm. And you can do that if you're a doctor in a hospital. You can do that if you're a lawyer in a law firm. You can certainly do that if you're a pastor or a rabbi or an imam. You can do that if you're in the business world. And we think that that's going to be one of the key kind of frameworks and skill sets of the 21st century mm -hmm. in this highly religiously diverse world in which too often faith is a barrier of division. We need a critical mass of people who are inspired and trained and skilled mm -hmm. to help faith become a bridge of cooperation. And can you give me some examples of specifically how the bridges are built and how people go about working together? That's a great question. Thank you for that. So uh, this goes back to kind of the, the original animating idea behind Interfaith Youth Corps, which is that service is something that all of our faith traditions and secular traditions call us to do, mm -hmm. and service is a great co common table for people to gather around. 
so what we what we train students to do in our interfaith leadership institutes is run interfaith service and dialogue projects and i'll give you a, a great example from my alma mater the university of illinois so uh... the the better together group and that's what the, these groups tend to be called at campuses across the country the better together or interfaith and in action group at, inter, at at the university of illinois would have kind of monthly interfaith dialogue meetings of their group and then every year they would run something called the interfaith in action day mm -hmm. and for several years it was modest in size like a hundred to hundred and fifty students and a handful of campus administrators would show up and you know kind of was getting a, a start like a lot of student groups do mm -hmm. and then a couple years ago there was that terrible earthquake in haiti and the leadership of that better together group at, at university of illinois decided that that they wanted to do something really big and significant to help folks who were suffering from that earthquake and mm -hmm. so they organized this huge interfaith service campaign and project in the university of illinois campus and community that brought over five thousand people from different religious and secular communities together mm -hmm. to package wow. over a million meals for people who suffered from the earthquake in haiti that's amazing uh, it, it 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 you know it improved lives there in a very concrete way they sure. got a major federal grant to do it and for me, that's a great example of excellent interfaith leadership. Because religious communities and secular communities have significant social capital, volunteers, energy, resources, an interfaith leader has the ability to mobilize that social capital in ways that benefit a larger community. Mm -hmm. And so the interfaith leaders at that University of Illinois group were able to go to the Muslim community, the Baha'i community, the uh, evangelical community, the Catholic community, the Jewish community, the secular humanist community, and bring them together for this common project of packing meals for Haiti. And then they had this huge wall where people could write their inspiration to serve. That mm -hmm. was kind of the interfaith dialogue part of the project. So there are biblical quotes on that wall. There are Quranic verses. There are quotes from Walt Whitman, mm -hmm. uh, from Secular Humanism. Uh, for me, it's a great example of uh, an effective bridging of social capital in ways that serve a broader community and build interfaith dialogue at right. the same time. Okay, very good. Let's move on to your book, Sacred Ground. Tell us a little bit about it and um, why you feel it was important to write it. Sure. So, uh, in the summer of 2010, mm -hmm. America was caught in this huge public discussion around the Ground Zero Mosque, right. originally named Cordoba House. Mm -hmm. And uh, the original vision of Cordoba House was that it would be kind of a Muslim YMCA, uh, uh, an institution founded by a, a Muslim community with, with the resources of a Muslim community, but that was meant to serve a broader public. Mm -hmm. It was meant to have a swimming pool, a culinary institute, an art gallery, and it was meant to be based in Lower Manhattan, not far from where Imam Faisal, who was the founder of the project, uh, had, his, had his mosque. And um, uh, you remember that uh, there was this huge public discussion around this center, mm -hmm. and uh, it was it, it came to be called a terrorist command center, mm -hmm. and Imam Faisal was called a radical imam. And I remember watching those news reports and reading the papers and, and thinking that I'd entered the twilight zone. I mean, I've known Imam Faisal for 10 years. Um, I knew about the plans for Cordoba House when they were just being launched. And, and I, I thought that this was actually uh, a part of, of the Muslim process of, of deeply integrating in America in the sense that our community was building an institution whose primary purpose was not to serve our own prayer needs, but was to serve a broader public's more community or social mm -hmm. needs. And so during that, during that time, I started going back in American history and looking at kind of the patterns of religious prejudice and religious pluralism in America. And one of the things that I discovered was that uh, I, I think across American history there's been this dynamic of what I call the forces of prejudice, the <laughs> forces that say to some communities at different times in history, you don't belong, right? Uh, the anti-Catholic forces during earlier eras, the anti-Semitic forces, clearly the racist forces in earlier eras of, of, of American history mm -hmm. saying, you don't belong. And then the forces of pluralism, the forces saying actually the idea of America is that we're a nation that welcomes the contributions of all communities and nurtures cooperation between them, those forces push back. And those forces have won era after era after era. Mm -hmm. And I kind of realized, you know, we're in a new chapter of that narrative, of the, the great narrative of American pluralism versus American prejudice. And what this book is, is it's kind of a 
a tracing of that of that story across American history mm -hmm. and a, kind of an explication of, of the chapter we're in right now and it's a call to the forces of pluralism of our era to stand up and engage and defeat the forces of prejudice whether it's anti-Muslim forces or anti-Mormon forces or anti-atheist forces it is incumbent upon us as Americans I think to recognize the precious treasure of, of pluralism and our nation's history but to know that that it has to be protected mm -hmm. and 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 that's what that's what sacred ground is about don't you um, I think part of the problem is the prejudice how do you get beyond that how do you fix that so our, our solution at Interfaith Youth Corps is to is to first of all illuminate the story of American pluralism uh, I'll tell you one one of my favorite parts of this. Uh, um, when George Washington first became president, uh, he received a message from a Jewish leader named Moses Sessius, effectively asking whether his people, Jews, would be safe in this new nation. And Washington wrote back a beautiful, a beautiful document called the Letter to the Hebrew Congregation of Newport, Rhode Island, which said that America would give bigotry no sanction and persecution no assistance. Mm -hmm. That's knowing the great heritage of pluralism in America, and I think one of the one of the ways that that the forces of, of pluralism in our era gain strength is to know the heritage and the legacy of pluralism in this mm -hmm. nation, and to have a sense that we're writing the next chapter in a glorious story. The skills of interfaith leadership are really important as well, and I talked about this a bit in the Coca-Cola lecture I gave yesterday having an appreciative knowledge of other religious traditions, mm -hmm. knowing about the social gospel and Christianity, knowing about uh, the, the role of mercy in Islam. We live in the most religiously diverse nation in human history. We ought to know something appreciative about the various religious communities of our nation, mm -hmm. how they've contributed to, to the growth and success of America, um, how their values uh, from Jainism or Buddhism are similar to values in Catholicism or Judaism. Uh, it's, it's, it's something we at Interfaith Youth Corps call interfaith literacy, and I think it's a key part of being an effective interfaith mm -hmm. leader. Okay. I think it's probably, um, you know, there are some religions and some people who, uh, um, you know, believers who naturally will work together, but how do you handle people who who are religious but are just so filled with hate for another form of religion. How do you break that down and deal with that? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, so in 15 years of doing this work <clears throat> and, and being in all sorts of communities, I've come to believe that, that the percentage of people who, who hate somebody from another religion is pretty small, mm -hmm. especially in America, right? My sense is, if you want to think of this as a continuum, there is a, a, on, there's, there's a, a huge chunk of the continuum that inclines in a really proactive way towards being interfaith leaders. And then there's probably the largest part of the continuum that's relatively neutral or doesn't think about this very often, but certainly isn't opposed to it. And then, and then the, the part of the continuum that is opposed to it is relatively small. So the way we work at Interfaith Youth Corps is to, is to look at the folks who are inclining towards this mm -hmm. and say, you need to be leaders who can go back to your communities, geographic, religious, ethnic, racial, et cetera, and, and convince them that religious pluralism is something that they have a stake in, right? So in, in a sense, what we do is inspire, train, and mobilize uh, young people on the on the end of the continuum that is already inclining towards this and it, mm -hmm. it's a leadership strategy sure. right and there's plenty of other strategies out there the one that we're choosing the one that we're betting on so to speak is is if we can empower a, a critical mass of interfaith leaders that will be the best way to convince a critical mass of the nation mm -hmm. that protecting the precious treasure of religious pluralism is something we ought to be doing. Right, right. And especially, I think it's important to, they're starting as the, they're young people, and as they grow, it, I think it will only help the future of the country. That's right. You know, so, so they'll have, you know, God willing, 50, 60, 70, 80 years right. to, to be advocates and leaders in protecting pluralism. Right. So if there is one thing that you would like to leave us with today, what would it be? What's the most important thing you think we should take away from our talk today? 
I think it's that all of us need to be interfaith leaders. Mm -hmm. All of us need to recognize just how important America's legacy of pluralism is. It is a remarkable thing that we live in a nation whose very idea is to welcome the contributions of various communities and nurture cooperation between them. Mm -hmm. But that idea didn't fall from the sky in the past, and it, it's not inevitable that it remains the beating heart of America. Yeah. We need a set of people with the inspiration, the knowledge base, and the skill set to protect that idea. And what that means is that we are able to build bridges between individuals and communities who orient around religion differently. And there's no more, more important time than now. America being the most religiously diverse nation in human history, the most religiously devout nation in the West at this time of global religious conflict. And uh, I think about the, the line from the Parliament of the World's Religions in 1893 in Chicago, and I think this is a, a kind of the mission statement of, of this movement, mm -hmm. is, is from now on, the great religions of the world make war no longer on each other and instead on the giant ills that afflict humankind. Sounds wonderful. Thank you very much for being here with us today and sharing some of your work. Thank you, Marilyn. For more information about Mr. Patel, please visit our website at yale.edu slash Macmillan Report. Be sure to join us again for another episode of the Macmillan Report, made possible through funding from the Whitney and Betty Macmillan Center for International and Area Studies at Yale.